Yeah, yeah. 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 When I spoke earlier about Mark Cook and I was out in Montana, I, um, uh, Mark introduced me to uh, one of the most brave women I've ever met in my life, who, um, again, like Mark, fights his fight every day and comes across some particularly evil people um, and stands up to them every day. A lot of respect for Casey. Casey York is from Traffy, Montana, and Traffy, Montana Public Land. She fights every day to try and well, at least get the laws changed on trapping in Montana, and she's going to tell you a lot about that today. Um, there are a few graphic images, but I, you know, we believe that it's, it's something that we need to see a little bit, and uh, Casey will fill you in, but um, Casey York, everyone. your love of wildlife and wolves, it's important to see the other side, because to truly love them, we have to know what they're enduring and, and facing and what we can possibly do to change it. Um, you can pull that down, I think. Yeah, Is that better? Are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have a choice. These animals do not. So it's important to know there's a lot of myths that we've heard about wolves. There's plenty of myths about trapping. Well, I want to have you walk away today knowing a little bit more because knowledge is power and power is change. We came up with this definition because we found it was very fitting for trapping. Um, our title, A Culture of Depraved Indifference, comes from the English common law term of depraved heart. Conduct wanton, deficient in a moral sense of concern, lacking in regard for life or the lives of others, intentionally, knowingly, manifests a reckless indifference to human life. The next slide, and I, and I should back up a little bit, I will try to warn you um, I have a couple that are particularly graphic. I have many more, unfortunately. And um, I didn't bring those, but I will try to, try to warn you. And for some, some of these that we unfortunately deal with on a daily basis, we've become a little bit more desensitized to them. We also show them, because to give testimony to these animals suffering, to the pain and the things they go through, um, like I said, we have a choice to look away, to say, I can't handle it. The animals do not. Many of you might know, um, this is Josh Bransford. He was a U.S. Forest Service employee. And um, he was out trapping wolves in Idaho, was contacted because this particular wolf was drawing some attention. He was told to come on out. You've got a wolf out here. Kids had taken pot shots. The blood you see um, from this trapped poor animal was from kids taking shots at him. Josh stopped to take a photo first before putting this animal out of his misery. He thought it was funny. Um, he was publicly humiliated, and yet, this went, this went national. We posted these photos. These photos went national, they went worldwide, and some said, oh, this poor guy. He wasn't charged with doing anything wrong. He, our, our taxpayers fund his work. This wasn't part of his work, this was his hobby. After this, he said he went out to set out another hundred snares. Snares are the wire, um, I have some over at the desk there, and I'll show you in a little bit. But they're a wire cable designed to strangle. And he said afterwards, he sent out about 100 snares to get the rest of the pack. This is the, um, the paw of that trapped wolf. He posted these pictures. These weren't something we found. He was very proud of what he did. So this is how we got these pictures.
This is common. They like to take the picture of their, their trapped animals, often before they kill it, and then afterwards. Um, this was very significant when um, I became a certified wolf trapper through Montana. They offer a free class. And they said Josh Bransford doing this could have been the end to all wolf trapping, to all trapping total, because people were so horrified. Trapping likes to stay underground, secreted, hidden. They don't want people to know what goes on. And by him doing this, there was an outpour. Um, and so we were urged in our trap certif certification class, don't take photos. Whatever you do, don't take photos, don't post them on social media. So, of course, we had to take the wolf trapping certification class to learn more what goes on. Um, it's a four to six hour class in Montana. It's free. There's no testing. Um, people, this is my particular wolf, wolf certification card. It's might have the expiration date, maybe I put it out. It's, it's in that, you know, it goes on forever. Um, you learn about how to trap wolves. They talk a lot about ethics, like that would have anything to do with trapping. And um, watching people sit in there, playing on their phones, they just want this card. That's what they're there for. They're not paying any attention. Not, they just want to be able to get out there and kill wolves. So often you will hear, well, how can you oppose trapping? How do you think they reintroduce the wolves to begin with? There's a significant difference between trapping wolves to help them and trapping wolves to kill them. So in the reintroduction process or when they're going to collar a wolf, Liz Bradley was the wolf specialist at the time in, in Montana, and I asked her. I knew the answers, but I needed to hear it from her. These traps are monitored. They are closely monitored, and they're not done in winter because they don't want frozen paws. Unlike our wolf trapping season, which is done in the dead of winter, they don't use, they use the cheapest or the most deadly traps that they can get because they don't really care about hurting the wolf for damaged paws. The only reason they care about a damaged paw is it might decrease the value of the pelt. So, as I said before, in some, I'll try to tell you when the slide is done because a couple of these could be extremely difficult to see. Um, but this next one, remember in the wolf trapping class, do not take pictures. Well, these wolf haters can't, can't help themselves. And as Steve witnessed, this one came down, the next photo you will see in a minute, came from Darby. And, and they, they're a minority, but they're so proud of what they do, and they feed on one another. They're very vocal, they're very threatening, and they're very intimidating. So the next picture is quite graphic, and it was um, just the opposite of what they were told. And this is exactly this quote from the wolf trapping certification class. It's in the manual, and I meant to bring a manual and I forgot. Think about what your grandmother would think of you if she saw what you do. And this, this wolf came out of the Bitterroot. It was one of the early ones to be trapped. The Bitterroot is, if you're not familiar, it's the western part of Montana, it goes down into Idaho, or south of Missoula. It runs about, Ravalli County, where I and Mark and Lorenzo are from, runs about 40 miles. Um, they paraded this wolf around in their vehicles, what they proclaimed after they trapped him. So these are our wolf regulations in Montana, 48 hour trap check. So they have to visually check, check that trap every 48 hours. They must be, they like the word dispatched. They must be dispatched immediately. That means killed immediately. They have to be killed by gunshot. And the trappers have to attend that free class, get their little card.
Just like when we hear about trophy hunting, they like to kill the finest, the rarest, rather than honor that animal, that incredible animal. It's like, look what I got. So whether it's a white beaver or a white elk or a white moose, a white wolf, and we're told in the trapping class, um, remember what I said about they have to be dispatched immediately. We're told in the trapping class, no shopping for wolves because they want to get a certain color. Now in Montana, you can't kill more than five wolves, whether it's by gunshot or trap. So if they trap um, a gray wolf, you know, gray colored pelt, they might go, oh, I really wanted a white one. I really wanted a black one. They're not allowed to do that. They're told you can't shop for wolves. They have to be dispatched immediately unless they have a collar and you can, they can be released, quote, unharmed. Well, when you see the traps, that's highly unlikely that that would ever happen. But I want you to think about a couple of things. I'm hoping we'll have some time for questions, but I don't know that we will. But think about why a 48-hour trap check for these animals. All the rest of our animals in Montana that are trapped, there is no trap check interval. They can go days, they can go weeks. So do they suffer any less than a wolf? Also, why do these animals have to be killed right away? Why these trapped wolves? Why do they have to be dispatched and by gunshot, only by gunshot, right away? Just kind of give that some thought. Why would that be? This ties into what I was saying. Montana has a D minus. We have incredible wildlife. They say the number one reason people live in Montana, visit Montana, move to Montana is our wildlife and our public lands. And yet we have a D minus nationally for our poor trapping regulations. As I said, no required trap check. Um, there's the regulations, I won't go into all those now because this is really, we're trying to focus a little more on wolves, but they're, they're just horrendous. They're poor and they're lax. And that's part of what our organization is working towards. Trapping reform, at least if we can get some things better, maybe there will be less suffering. Maybe it'll be harder for these trappers to do what they do. These are Montana's fur bearers. Um, you've got your bobcat, Fisher, Fisher right now is, is one of the candidates for your, um, the ESA is looking at Fisher. The swift fox, they're so few and so rare and yet we continue to allow trapping of them. It's a small quota, but why are we trapping any of them? The wolverine, that took a lawsuit in Montana to stop the trapping of wolverine. There's only 200 believed in the continental US. Most of them in, are in Montana. They're known as the glutton of gluttons. Trappers hated them because they would always steal the trap line. They live a very harsh life, so any food they could find. You have um, your river otter, your pine martin, these cute little things that they live up in the trees. They like to put conibear body crushing traps up in the tree, faded on the other side, um, so they can run through and be killed. You have beaver. Down on the left is muskrat. Muskrat and coyote are the number one animals that are trapped in Montana. Um, and then the far right is mink. Those are what's called fur bearers, classified as fur bearers. What does that tell you about the mentality when we call these animals fur bearers? This goes back to those trapping regulations. This guy, he's a Missoula trapper. He says he checks that line once a week. Uh, Warden told me there's a commercial trapper in Montana. He gets from one end of his trap line to the other in a month. You can trap, there's no limit to how many traps you can set out or for how far they can go. Trappers will say, I can trap as long as the day is long. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks tells us when we want and demand 24-hour trap checks so these animals don't suffer forever, they say that's too hard on the trappers to have to go out in that cold, frigid snow every 24 hours. We have to know what goes on. 
We can't continue to look away because some of us might love animals that much or might be that compassionate. Notice the little raccoon peeking out of this. This was actually a beaver killing derby in Canada. We saw the photo and wanted to point out in Montana because people were so horrified and they don't like to think this happens where they live. Beaver, as we heard earlier, are probably one of the most important species to all wildlife. They create the wetlands for, for moose, for our water, for, for actually for agriculture, for big game browse. And beaver can be trapped in Montana six to nine months out of the year. All you have to do if you're a resident is buy a $29 trapping license. You can trap as many beaver as you want and tell no one. How is that science-based? In Montana, in the last three recorded years, over 192,000 wildlife, this doesn't include wolves, 192,000 wildlife were reported killed by trapping, on average 60,000 a year. Most of those species don't have to be reported trapped. This number comes from one-third of trappers voluntarily reporting. So we don't know how many this is. We don't know if that average of 60,000 is twice, three times that number. Does it include the ones that are trapped, that are released, or weren't allowed to be trapped? Does it include the collateral damage, the orphaned young, the injured ones that escape, and they do it? Every year I get a call on an animal, Casey, can you help? There's a fox running around with a trap on its leg, and I've yet to be able to catch any of them. This is one of our latest, most infamous trappers in Montana. Um, there, he's become iconic with the, the Montana Trappers Association, and he's now been appointed this district director. And he and his daughter together um, got this. So the eight wolves, remember they can only have five together. He's also the one during our very first, we've had two now, um, wolf and coyote killing contests up in Sanders County, northwest of, of Montana. It's on private land, so we can't, some of you might have heard some of the other states are going after it because it's public land. This is private land. And there were 100 participants this first go around. Dan, the same gentleman who you saw in his barn previously, he trapped this one lone wolf. Now, they were such a frenzy and they were so excited about this. It breaks my heart to think what this one wolf would have endured with all these participants and this one wolf was caught in a trap. What did he go through? And then the trapper, Dan, said, the, um, there's a thing called a gavel, in other words, the anchor at the end of the trap, that he had gotten free with that. If only he had backed up, he would have gotten away. Well, he would have gotten away with this trap on his leg, but... And when I, we also think that was photoshopped, which is very common. There's some posts you might see lately, if any of you go to these despicable, disgusting sites. I do, I have to, I have to monitor what's happening. I have to keep my enemy my friend's close and my enemy's closer, and um, they, they often will do that. I don't think, that doesn't look like last year's pups. They determine that by the teeth. Um, I think it just made it. They want to make them like these great big monsters. So this is, these are the traps that we're talking about, how they do it. The top left is your conibear that was developed by a French-Canadian um, trapper by the name of conibear because people complain about the suffering. So it's designed to be a quick kill. It's a body crushing trap. They go, I have one back on my desk, they go to enter it, put the bait on the other side, it slams them, breaks their neck, their spine, depending upon where, um, where it hits them. Then your leg hole traps, um, and then a snare. Snares are very cheap. They're illegal in Montana to snare wolves but they're, they cost two dollars. So, and you can't, they're hard to see. I'll show you in a little bit. Well, how does a wolf know that's not for me? You know? So I just want to show you real quick. Um, it's to me to be able to see hands on. And you can also visit me back at my desk. So 
So here is a, a leg hole trap that would be um, for coyotes. And this has an offset, meaning in the center it doesn't close all the way. And, and I can, there's different arguments about that. Some say, well, we don't want that, that paw to go numb. If it's closed all the way, it's going to go numb and they're going to chew on it. And they're going to get free. Or they're going to twist it off. They call it ring off. Because they're not going to sit there. They struggle and struggle and fight. They dislocate limbs. Um, they might look fine, but studies show afterwards these animals are injured. They are hurt severely. But this would be a number three used for coyotes. Here is what they're using now for, for wolf traps. One of the, this one would be, it has laminated jaws, because that's supposed to be a soft catch, not hurt as much, not, well, not cut as much. Um, I can't open this. Mark will show us afterwards from Wells of the Rockies at the end. You have, the, I'm not heavy enough. I'm not strong enough. If you pull down on these levers, you have to stand on them. Trappers have trap setting devices to do this. There's really no such thing, though, as wolf trapping, and we'll hear that a lot. They'll say, what do you think of wolf trapping? There's no such thing. Traps don't discriminate. Anything that eats, flies, has territory, looks for a mate, goes to get a drink, there is no animal that we know of that has not been caught in a trap, or no species. This was an owl. This picture was sent to me, and I just cared about, get it help. Where is it? Let's get it help. This was, um, I think this one came out of Minnesota. And I, there's another one I know of. There's a snare wrapped around this moose's snout, the wire cable, so it starved to death. This was Miss, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and it's not fair for me to kind of make it sound like the wrong one. Any case, the warden told him, just go ahead and leave the moose. He was trapping coyotes. And, and when they, it's in the paper, the article, and they said, what do you think of this? He's, Shit happens. And he said, now those coyotes should be that much fatter. I'm going to go back out there with my snares because the coyotes will be feeding on this moose that I got. This is a muskrat and um, a rainbow trout in one of those body-crushing conibear traps. Pronghorn. There's a leg hole. You can't see it very well, but down. We've had deer, all, all kinds of animals. In Montana, they have to report any trapped animal that they're not allowed to trap only if it was un, only if it could not be released uninjured. Well, who determines that? The trapper. A lot of these injuries they don't see because they release the trap and the animal runs off or the bird flies away or the bird sits there and looks at them. Um, I got somebody convicted of that because he didn't report it. But, but that does not mean the animal's uninjured. So we're going to push. We want to know every single one of these animals. Here this eagle, he's got a trap. This was this year. It's hanging off his leg. He's feeding in a land dump somewhere because he can't. And I don't know if he's been caught to get that trap off. Some of you might know the Alaska story. This gal is hiking with her dogs, not opposed to trapping. This eagle, this bald eagle, is caught in both hind legs. And um, she was charged for releasing this eagle. She got it help immediately, and she sprung a couple other traps on the way. That was probably what got her. But she was like, I have my dogs. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? And here's another view. What attracted this eagle, that bait hanging there, is beaver carcass. So this shows you some of the different size leg hole traps that I was showing you and how much bigger it has gotten with, with, for the wolf trap, um, or the trap designed to trap wolves. Wolves fight traps very hard, they say, so they want these big, monstrous traps. However, in doing that, we're, we're seeing big, more monstrous animals getting caught. Was a child caught in a trap recently? 
There have been children caught in traps, yeah, yeah. We, and we can talk a little bit about, just because I want to, okay? Uh -huh. um, so pets, we've had over 100 dogs caught in traps reported in Montana in a period of two years. These are just the ones that are reported. Some people are afraid to report. It's illegal, to, we, not anymore for your dog, but like in the case of the eagle, it's illegal to, for you to remove an animal from a trap. So people get their dog out of a trap and then they, they're mad. They destroy the trap, they take the trap. Well, now they're in trouble. So they don't report it. We had a trapper say, I'll pay your vet bills, just don't turn me in. So they hold our public lands hostage. We don't know where these traps are. Your dog goes for a run. We don't have a leash law in Montana on public lands. It doesn't mean that your dog's out of control. They could be under voice control. They could be on a leash and still get caught in a trap. They're a canine, they're attracted to those scents, those baits. This is the MB750, this is a more popular trap. This trap runs probably $35 to $50, versus the one behind me is more like $100. So grizzly, we're starting to see grizzly, and we're trying to point that out when they talk about delisting the grizzly. Um, this one they reported, they said it was released without incident. And I say, tell that to the grizzly. This is a pocket gopher that was caught in a trap set for wolves. The trappers thought this was funny. That poor animal, to have, you'll see, if some of you haven't witnessed the power of how these shut. They shut fast and they shut hard because they don't want that animal to get in the way. Um, this dog, Darby, interesting enough, she was from Darby and Akita. They had, it was caught um, a year or two ago in a trap set for wolves. They had to chip the ice away to get that, that trap out and get um, his foot out. The next photo will show the damage, just a warning, the next photo will show the damage that was done to his limb. So he wound up losing his leg. He also lost his home. He was put up for adoption because the people said, they're trapping all around outside my property. And you know when these, these breeds tend to, Akitas, Malamutes, Huskies, they do tend to be a little harder to keep at home. Again, wildlife don't know the boundaries, often dogs don't either. And for I don't mean to pass judgment on them, I get it. They couldn't bear, he had been missing four or five days. I think the only thing that kept him alive was his fur coat. I don't know how he managed, because we have others that were found that did not survive even after they had vet care. But so they rehomed him because they were so afraid this would happen again to him. So this shows you a little bit. Sometimes people will say, Casey, you know, can you take me out? Let's go look for traps. Where are they? So this will give you a little bit, a little bit of an idea of how, what it, how difficult it is. This would be called a pee post. So they're going to take urine, you can purchase coyote urine, all the different animal urines, wolf urine, wolves in heat urine, and they'll put it on that post. And the trap is, is down in, there in the center. Can you, will that work on there or are you too far for the red laser? Okay, well it's, it's in between there. There's a snare on a path. They like to put snares where animals go running through. So the snare then chokes them to death. Just pulls them and they're, and they're dead. Snares are currently, I, oh I mentioned that about wolves. The trappers are pushing for that because they're so lethal, they're so cheap, they want, they want snares for wolves. Anyone have an idea where the trap is on that? It's in between the two grass mounds. Now, I mean, I go out a lot looking for traps. I need to know, I need to take photographs. We encourage people to do it. You cannot take them, you cannot touch them, you cannot tamper with them, but to warn others where they're at. There's a conibear that would be set for beaver. 
It's further in the back. In Montana, the bigger comma bears that are 10 by 10 have to be in an enclosure, actually anything 7 by 7, so they could put it in a bucket. But that bucket has bait on the other side. Your dog's out there. They stick their heads. 7 by 7 inches is still a good size. Um, these bigger ones, they don't have to be submerged. They don't have to be in a cubby if they're in water. As long as one third or more is submerged, well, dogs have been getting caught and killed in these. They die in a matter of less than less than minutes, less than two or three minutes. That crushing, you'll hear their wheezing, and they're so difficult not only to figure out how to get off, but to get off. Here's a snare, snare in the middle of, of this, the, the trail in the snow. This gives you a little bit of an idea of them setting a trap, a leg hole trap in the dirt for, for wolves and then afterwards. So when we're out looking, I'm always suspicious. What is that? What is that? Is that it? Is it a, you know? So here, do you spot the trap? Next slide. <laughs> that was it. So there's a snare. Again, it can look like a like a you know tree limb. Here's that P post set. Notice the trail. So if you're going down there or or anything, it's gonna that scent and and run over to there. So there's be a leg hole trap. And usually there's not just one. I mean, they're not going to set one. Where you find one, there's going to be more. And often they'll combine it with snares, and they'll do a circle. So the animal, if they can get those animals in that area, they're going to do everything they can to make sure they get trapped. Here's a snare with bait on the other side. Montana Trapping Association president just recently said how he's so proud of himself. I think he met his quota this year. Um, and he lives in the Bitterroot. And he said how easy it is that in trap training class for wolves, we're told all these things. All he had to do is put out hay and cover up his traps with hay to get these animals. Well, we also have elk going in there. So what are the chances that these elk are going to step in these monstrous traps? We have known it's happened before. Besides the fact, that's illegal. At least to be putting hay out where you're not allowed to put hay out for wildlife. We also have an issue with noxious weeds in, in the, on public land. I'm sure he's not buying certified weed-free hay. So this is the number of wolves reported trapped in, um, in Montana since the trapping season has started. These are just the ones reported. They're very brazen in their mentality, kill them all publicly. SSS, shoot, shovel, shut up, poison them, gut shoot them. Um, I, again, they're the minority, but they're very powerful, they're very vocal, and they're deadly. Um, this one is a quote. Many of these trappers lie and say, oh, they're asleep when I get there, or it doesn't hurt them, trapping has come a long way. This trapper was the vice president of the Montana Trappers Association, and at least he was honest. Notice on this animal's paw as well, he started chewing on it to, to get free. I was called on this one um, a couple of years ago. This was set for wolves in the Bitterroot. Actually, a lion houndsman, a former president of the of the Bitterroot Houndsman Association called me. He doesn't like trapping. And he said, Casey, you gotta come take a look at this trap with me. Wolf trapping season had long closed. I don't remember how many weeks or a month. This is a mountain lion paw. It's in an MB750 set for wolves. This lion, it was wrapped around the chain, the, the, the trap comes with a chain to anchor it. It had wrapped around a tree and had torn up that tree to try to escape, and it finally twisted off its paw. Trappers call this ring off. Some of these ring off survive. This mountain lion was shot, missing a paw. 
These are the numbers we know. These are the 48 mountain lions in Montana that were reported trapped. Look at the percentage that are injured. 84%. And then when they're injured, what happens later on? Carter Niemeyer, you probably have heard Mark mentioned him. Um, he's one of our most educational and greatest assets because he was a trapper. He was a government trapper. He helped reintroduce wolves. And, and he's, I, I like to think of him as a mentor. He has taught me so much. And he said after 24 hours, there is damage, there's, there's frostbite. They will likely perish. We have no trap check in Montana. Again, 48 hours for wolves. Not all of these mountain lions are caught in trap set for wolves. So when they're released, quote, unharmed, because they ran off, we don't really know what happened to them later on. On that, other, on that other picture with that wolf, I just wanted to make a comment again. That wolf was found alive. I think this wolf, some of you might have seen this photo. I think this wolf was, I think it was in Alaska. They were not allowed to do anything. Once those animals become trapped, they are the property of the trapper in Montana. I don't know about elsewhere. But they're the property of the trapper. So then there's the different ways of killing them. Remember I said wolves can only be killed, trapped wolves by gunshot. Well, all the rest of them, anything goes in Montana. This is a common method. It's compression. They're stepping on him to, to suffocate him, to break his neck, to whatever, to dispatch him. This is another very common one because some of them don't want to get that up close. These are like a dog catcher would use and they choke them down. Why do they do this? They want to preserve that pelt. They don't want a bullet hole. So whatever is going to be the way to not damage that pelt. Drowning is very common. This, this raccoon has a lead hole trap. He's in the water. The trapper goes there with this pole, probably to pull him in or something. This to me, I've been doing this many years and I've seen way more than any normal human being should see. I don't know that I'm not normal anyhow. But he swims over to the pole for help. And then the trapper stops and holds him underwater to drown him. This came from Born Free. They, they did an undercover video to show what goes on, what really goes on. I don't, I don't know how they do it. I've seen a lot, but I could not stand there and watch these things happening. I couldn't have done it. Give them a lot of credit. Um, here, he's got a hammer or a mallet, coyote in the front, fox in the back. That's also a pretty common method to kill them, to beat them to death. But he stopped for a picture. It's so common. This is in the in Montana, especially where we are over on, on the western part of Montana, promoting this thing with their children. When we ask, how do people do this? How, how can anyone? Well, your parents are your greatest instructors. You, you know, when you're a little kid, that's your idol. And you, or you at least want to please them. So he, he thought a baseball bat was for a sport. They trapped that coyote, and then with his children, they beat it with his baseball bat. Um, I didn't create this picture. This is what they created, promoting what they do. Some of them would even say, love wildlife, get outdoors, love wildlife, get out there and trap. I love it so much, I'm going to kill it, I'm going to make it suffer. <laughs> I figured you needed this after all that, right? It's one of my favorites. So, so what do we do? First of all, you will hear again and again, I don't, no matter the state, trapping is highly re regulated. It's a necessary management tool. One thing we agree on with the trappers, both sides are saying it needs to be science-based. You people are all emotional driven and Ballot box biology, because we tried to achieve trap-free public lands in Montana. We agree. 
We'll show you the science. We'll show you the need for these predators. We'll show you that trapping does not control disease. They don't want disease-ridden animals anyhow. They want the best pelts. Trapping, these animals aren't going to go rabid. They're not going to be overpopulated. They, they suffer. It's unnecessary. And it's market-driven. Big money supports trapping. You heard before. Safari Club International, some say NRA. NRA was heavily involved recently in a bill we just won, thank goodness, or defeated. Um, what doesn't help either, back in my, my day, I'm really aging myself, but I remember Fur Free Fridays and marching, you know, in the, in the 70s. Fur became unfashionable. It has had a whole new resurrection. Um, these, you've got movie stars, you've got actors, actresses, musicians, and then they try to tell you it's humane. You'll see a thing called Origin Assured, OA, that we know what went on and there was no cruelty involved. We, that's where it gets back to. You have to know, you have to say, well, show me the science, show me the evidence. Wildlife watching. Huge. Animals are worth so much more. Our wildlife is worth so much more to many alive than dead to a few. We have got to get a voice. And I think, I agree with Mark, if people had the opportunity to pay, to say, you know what, I'll pay to not kill that, that animal, they would. But that frightens them. They don't want to hear that. But we've got to be more and more vocal and more demanding. This kind of shows you the numbers. Often we'll hear people um, will say, well, what can I do? For example, I'm not in Montana or elsewhere. I know in Montana, tourism is our second leading industry. And as our governor recently said, they're not coming for our Walmarts. <laughs> they're coming for our public lands, which are at significant risk of being sold off. And guess who's behind it? The trappers. Senator Fielder just introduced and we defeated this horrible bill that would have made trapping and hunting and fishing a citizen's right in the Constitution and to continue the existing methods that are used to do these horrendous things and to make them the preferred methods of managing wildlife and to put the legislature in charge and they would designate what agency would do the enforcement. Perhaps instead of fish, wildlife, and parks, they would turn more over to Department of Livestock. What would happen then? So, um, Wolves of the Rockies helped us. Bow Hunters opposed it. Montana Wildlife Federation opposed it. And we defeated it last week. But the one behind it was Senator Fielder. She is the CEO of the American Lands Council, which is the ones across the West that are trying to take control over public federal lands. Why this is so important, or ties in also to the non-residents, you need to, what you can do to help us is to contact our governor, contact our Department of Tourism. Some will say boycott Montana. I wouldn't support that, and I think that would come back to fire on us. But if they continually hear, we value your wildlife. We want to see it. Yellowstone's getting overcrowded because so many want to go. So let's go elsewhere. Let's try, where else can I see wildlife? Well, you can't see a whole lot of fur bearers and predators when we're killing, trapping alone, at least 60,000 a year. So your voice does matter. You could also do this. <laughs> you heard about the non-lethal methods. There's many, I won't go into the livestock ones. And they find there's not, there's not one method, and it's not going to last that long. Wolves are afraid of the fly grenade. They're a little shyer creature. But generally, it's only going to last two weeks. So you have, they have to implement other things. But we've got a thing like called night guard, that there are lights for some smaller predators on your property. There's, there's a, a thing called beaver deceiver that fools the beaver. So when there's problems with, oh, now they're going to flood this land or these fears. There's so many other things that we can do, and they're cost-effective. If we just continually kill them, they reply, they respond with larger litters, they're killed, larger litters, and on and on, and, and trapping 
being indiscriminate, you're not necessarily getting that problem animal. You're not, it can't target, like I'm not gonna say, a, well, like a bullet, I wouldn't necessarily advocate that, but how unfair just to go set out all these traps. You might just be killing animals that weren't gonna hurt your livestock whatsoever, but now you've opened that territory to those that will. Kids, children, our next generation, it's critical. Now with all the iPads and technology, they're, they're losing that connection to the outdoors. If, to want to wanna change or care about something, you have to know it. You have to relate to it. They found the most effective thing is for people, us being quite self-centered, how does it affect me emotionally or financially or both? So we have to form that connection. Where I live, the trappers do all these shows for trapping with children. They have a trapper youth camp. They go to the schools and bring all the dead animals and promote that. We have to counter that. We have to get into the schools, we have to get parents taking their children out, showing them wildlife has an intrinsic value. They're not just here for us. They're not just here for us to kill or exploit, learn about them, appreciate them, and understand them. Thank you. I hope I didn't run out of time. I have no conception of time, so I appreciate it, and I hope I don't leave you upset. And so I, I did want to make one comment because I think it's important, and um, that Josh Bransford photo with the, that poor bloodied wolf, um, we were the ones that posted that photo, and um, I, got a, I got a threat that I'm going to come and kill your children and make you watch. And because they tracked it to came out of state lines, um, the FBI was involved, nothing, nothing came of it. But where we live, people are afraid. They're afraid to put a bumper sticker on their car saying, you know, um, I love wolves, or um, like those bumper stickers I have, I'm a lover, I'm not a trapper. We had businesses that supported us, and once we tried to promote them, they, um, they were harassed, and they were targeted. People were told, don't buy from them, don't go shop there. So we live in, we need your help. We need your, your support, um, and it starts with your love for the wolf. Thank you. Steve knows from his trip to Montana. This is actually happening. I know it's hard to believe here in Sedona that these things actually happen, but they do. And that's why it's really important that we support their efforts. So thank you so much. And Casey's going to take those traps outside, and she's going to show them to anyone who's interested in seeing uh, exactly what can be done. And it's important that you all leave here today with this understanding of this and that you spread the word, be their voice. That is the whole point of Sedona Wolf Week.